And good morning. We welcome you to Building Capacity for Local Data Collection with Shai Fuchsman. This presentation has been prepared for the Great Lakes PTTC under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services. The PTTC believes that words matter and uses affirming language in all activities. We have a few housekeeping items and these will also be in your chat. So if you need to refer to them, you can do so there. Um, if you have technical issues, please individually message me, Rebecca Buller, uh, Alyssa Kuala, or Jen Winslow in the chat section at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be happy to assist you. If captions or live transcript would be helpful, please use your Zoom toolbar near the bottom of your screen to enable by going into the More section, select Captions, and then Show Captions. Questions for the speaker, we're going to ask that you put those in the chat. We will pause at a couple of uh, appropriate times to address questions, or if you need clarification, we'll be watching the chat and we'll help um, Shai find those questions in a timely manner. Uh, at the end, you will be redirected uh, to a link, which is as a short survey. And we would really appreciate it if you could fill that out. It takes about three minutes. We use it to report to SAMHSA and it helps us continue to provide trainings like this one. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended the full session. And it can take up to two weeks to receive those certificates. If you'd like to know more about what we are doing or information on upcoming events, please see our social media pages. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Shai Fuchsman, a behavioral health expert and senior research scientist, leads initiatives promoting the positive development of youth. He has extensive experience in social and emotional learning, school-based trauma-informed care, and substance misuse prevention. He also has expertise in program evaluation, cultural competence, and quantitative and qualitative research. As a prevention solutions uh, EDC training and technical assistance specialist, he supports state agencies and community-based organizations to implement and evaluate effective substance misuse prevention. I will stop sharing and turn things over to Shy. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to um, be here with you all and spend the next hour and a half or so talking about data collection. Let me first share my screen and make sure I get it right. Okay. Can people see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So again, good morning, everyone. As Rebecca said, my name is Shai Fuchsman. I'm a researcher uh, at Education Development Center based in Massachusetts. I'm, so I'm an hour ahead at 10 a.m., but um, I'm still sleepy, so uh, it feels like 9 a.m. for me. Um, and um, so let me get started. Um, so I wanted to start off by uh, giving you all an opportunity, and I noticed that some people have already been um, introducing yourselves. So I just want to ask everyone else, if you have introduced yourself, please uh, do so. Um, I'd love to know who's here with us. Uh, let us know your name, your role, organization in uh, city and state. Um, and I love seeing where everyone is um, coming from. I see Vermont, Indiana, Illinois, Texas, Louisiana, Indiana, Florida, Washington. Oh, so it's 7 a.m. in Seth in Washington. So you, um, yeah, so you just woke up, I'm guessing. Um, New York, Ohio, Illinois, um, great. Uh, please continue to let us know who's here um, and I'll, while I jump into the today's content. So um, as another way of getting, uh, breaking the ice and making all of us feel a little bit more comfortable with today's content, 
I also want to play a little game uh, before we get started, which is um, to get your reaction uh, when you hear data collection. So we're going to be talking a lot about data collection. I'm curious where you're at right now. How are you feeling about the fact that we're about to spend the next hour and a half talking about data collection? Uh, for those of you not familiar with the TV show, The Office, this is Michael Scott. He's one of the characters, the main character. Um, and as you can see, he has a lot of great expressions. And so what I'd like to ask you to do is identify which one of these reactions, uh, these facial reactions on the screen that best describes how you feel about data collection. Um, are you crying like A? Are you happy uh, and comfortable like C? Are you really ex excited, excited like E? <laughs> Are you, do you feel like data collection is, is a challenge you're willing to take on, uh, like an I? Uh, so again, pick the, the expression, look at the letter, and let me know in the chat, how do you all feel about data Shai, collection? I am watching this chat go by, and I don't know why, but it's cracking me up. People are um, kind of all over the board. A lot of, I, I'm surprised about um, the number of people in the middle at E, the like express, expression on that, that expression on their face, but some people also D and F. Um, I like G, which cracks me up. I don't know why I find these so funny. Um, some A's. We really have some people who are like, yikes. Um, A and F. Yeah, uh-huh. That's. <laughs> I see but, a few I's, a few people willing to take the challenge. That's great, yeah. too. Yeah, this is great. Um, thank you guys for being honest in your responses and uh, letting us know you. You're maybe in that A, and those of you who are feeling super excited and ready to take it on, um, thank you so much. Somewhere between B and I. <laughs> you guys are great. Um, so yeah, thanks for the honesty. Um, it's and, a fun um, way to do that. Kellen's comment, I'd rather chat with Toby, clearly an office fan, <laughs> as am I. Um, <laughs> talking to Toby, we know, those of you, those of us who watch your show know that's not a pleasant experience. So that says a lot about what, how you feel about it. Anyway, my goal uh, for the next uh, 90 minutes or so is to get you all to E. So so here we go. Let's let's see how many of you can be can move to that E square by the end of today's session. So the learning objectives for today. Um, so first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what are the different types of local data that is needed to conduct prevention on uh, needs assessment and program monitoring. We're also going to be talking a little bit about what do we mean by needs assessment and progress monitoring to connect the different kinds of data that you might collect to uh, those two uh, important uh, processes within the prevention within the prevention efforts. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, partners that you might want to rely on or connect with uh, to gather local data. And lastly, we're going to talk about specific strategies to increase your capacity to understand and use local data effectively. So that's what we're hoping to accomplish today, again, with the goal of having that E face by the end of today's session. Um, and as you can see, we're hoping to make this a very interactive session. So this is a session that I'd love for you all to participate. Uh, here's yet another opportunity uh, to participate. I'd love for all of you to type in the chat why collect local data? Why do you think it's important to collect local data as part of our prevention efforts? Um, so feel free to just type in the chat. Uh, and by the way, I promise it will be actual content, not just questions for you all, but I but I would, would love to start with, with this question. Um, my chat keeps jumping to the top, but I can see to determine the need, to assess need. So many of you, uh, some several of you are talking about the importance of identifying lo uh, local needs. Um, yeah. to inform prevention efforts. Yep. Uh, I'm trying um, to keep track with you. Sure. At least someone to take snapshots of the climate in the area we're working. That's great. Um, and to, to identify the right uh, uh, intervention. Yeah. So by mm -hmm. assessing needs and then figure out based on needs, what do you need? What would be the best uh, kinds of interventions? Establish um, a baseline. That's a great one. Understand effectiveness of the program, another good one. To see to where, where we're going. going. Yeah. Oh, we both loved that one at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so let me uh, keep uh, typing uh, these comments because they're all very helpful, not just for me, but for all of you. And while you do that, um, I'm gonna give you some of the reasons we came up with, although uh, some are covered in what you said and, and, and some are new. Uh, um, 
that means that some of yours are are are, new, are added to ours. Um, so to determine what needs to address, so several so of you mentioned that. Uh, determine the if the program is working. So that's kind of the program evaluation part. Uh, you know, once you select the right program or right, right intervention, you can uh, and you've implemented it to see if it's working, if it's accomplishing its goals. Uh, to document our efforts, including adaptations. So we're going to talk a little bit about monitoring program implementation. Um, and so to see, you know, are you implementing the programs as intended? And if you're, if not, if you're making adaptations, to document those um, those um, adaptations. Um, to inform decisions about the future, several of you made, alluded to that as well, uh, to see where you're going. I think that was one of the comments that we like. Uh, so similarly, to, um, an idea of informing decisions about the future, where to go next. Um, and to tell your story, to share your success. Um, you know, you want to build uh, support for your prevention efforts in your community, uh, among stakeholders, um, funders. And so be, having that data to show that what your efforts are actually working, uh, how you're succeeding, is important, um, another important way to use data. Um, so, so that's the reasons to collect data. Uh, and again, before we jump into how to collect data, we also want to make sure that we're connecting the idea of collecting data and using data to how we do prevention well. And so to do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this concept of theory of change. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, and to see how data can help us to inform the theory of change, which is the theory that informs what we actually do um, and how we do it to prevent substance misuse in our communities. Uh, so we begin with a need statement. Um, again, several of you mentioned this, you know, you want data to assess needs. Um, and so you want to have to understand uh, specifically, what is the problem that you're trying to address or problems? Is it um, underage drinking? Is it um, uh, marijuana use? Is it uh, the misuse of uh, non-medical use of prescription uh, drugs? Um, and what is the reasons for the problem, uh, including risk factors? Um, you know, why is it that young people are drinking? Um, or why are people tend, why is there an increase in non-medical use of prescription drugs? So um, as I go through this, I'm going to also give you an example, a simple example, just to um, help explain each step of the way. So let's say my issue, uh, so you know, I'm, I'm not going to use a uh, substance misuse uh, issue. I'm going to use a different example. Let's say my issue is that I, I've noticed I've been feeling a lot of headaches. Um, so I constantly throughout the day, it's not true, but as an example, uh, I keep having headaches and I've identified, so that's my problem. I have a headache. Uh, I constantly have headaches. The reasons for the problem I identified is lack of sleep. I'm not sleeping well enough and therefore I have um, headaches. So that's, that's my need statement. Um, so once you have your need, once you identify what is the problem and why it's happening, then you wanna identify your goals and objectives. So what do we need to do? How, you know, so obviously one of them is to reduce the substance, uh, to reduce the problem, to address the problem, but by, by doing that, by addressing the risk factors or, or, to, or, for, or in, by increasing protective factors. Um, so again, address the problem by addressing the reason. So in my example, I decide to reduce headaches I'm going to improve, I'm going to address the, the, the reason, which is I'm going to improve my sleeping habits. So I'm going to get better night's sleep so that I can reduce my headaches. So that's kind of, those are my goals. And uh, the goal is to reduce headaches. Objective is to improve how, um, sleep habits. And then that's when I get to strategy. So what am I going to, what am I going to do? How am I, am I going to address the problem? And how am I going to address the reason for the problem? Uh, so in my case, I'm going to practice healthy sleep hygiene. So I'm going to make sure I'm in bed by 10 p.m. I'm going to make sure I stop using electronic devices uh, an hour before sleep. I'm going to make sure that I get exercise during the day, but stop exercising three hours before bedtime. These are all practices that can help me um, uh, um, improve my sleep. So those are my strategies. Those are very specific strategies. Um, and then once I have the strategies, I want to make sure I'm measuring outcomes. And I want to make sure that I am actually addressing the reasons, the short-term uh, reasons for the problem, and ultimately that that leads to long-term outcome of actually reducing the problem. So in my case, the short-term is improving sleeping. So if I, I can measure how many hours, continuous hours of sleep I'm getting, that's my short-term outcome as a result of my strategies. And then the long-term outcome is to notice, am I also reducing the original problem, which is uh, headaches. So that's kind of an analogy of how you think about theory of change for substance misuse prevention. Again, I'm assuming this is um, a review for most of you. Um, uh, you know, and you're that's how you're already thinking about your prevention efforts. So, having said that, 
where does data come in? Um, so first, we want to collect data, as many of you mentioned, needs in the need statement. How do we use data to identify what is the problem and why it's happening? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. So that's one place in which data is critical for our efforts to prevent substance misuse. Um, and so that's a needs assessment. Um, then the other place where we want to um, collect data is to uh, measure, uh, monitor the implementation of our strategies. So are we implementing uh, strategies as intended? So in my example, measuring how many nights do I get, uh, do I go to bed at 10? Am I able to consistently go to bed by 10? How many nights do I um, am I able to stop um, using electronics in, in time? Um, so that in, in your case, it might be um, if it's a curriculum, how many uh, modules are being implemented, um, how many people are participating, in, how many students are receiving the program. These are all the data around the implementation of your strategies or of your programs. So that's the second place, the process evaluation. And the third place where data becomes really important is in the outcome evaluation. Did I achieve my outcomes? Am I sleeping eight hours a night uh, continuously? Am I also feeling fewer headaches? Um, and that's in your case, for, or that's outcome evaluation. In your case, that might be, uh, are you actually seeing a decline in substance misuse um, as your long-term outcome, short-term outcomes, depending on, depend on the risk factor. It might be, did I manage to, you know, did, did our efforts increase the perception of harm? You know, we think that young people are using marijuana because they don't, they think, it, they don't realize how dangerous it is. So our goal, our strategies, uh, through our strategies, we're going to increase the perception of harm. The short-term um, outcome might be um, to uh, see an increase in perception of harm. So those are the three key points in which uh, data uh, is really important to inform prevention efforts. So now that we know how data is helpful for prevention efforts, let's now jump into talking about actual uh, data collection. Um, and data collection, whether you're doing it for research, for needs assessment, for uh, program, uh, for outcome evaluation, any kind of data collection should always begin with questions. What are the questions you're trying to answer through your data collection? Uh, that will guide not only uh, deciding what data to collect and how you will collect it, but it will also help to guide the analysis of the data. What are how once you have the data, how do you answer? How do you use the data to answer your questions? So in terms of a needs, a needs assessment question, so that's kind of the first step uh, that, again, many of you mentioned. Um, very simply, you can think about the questions you want to answer as what, who, when, where, how, and why. So starting with the what, what is the problem? Uh, what are the specific substance misuse behaviors that, we, uh, that we're seeing in our community? Is it underage drinking? Is it marijuana use? Is it non-medical use of prescription drugs? Is it um, uh, opioids, uh, illicit opioids, or... Uh, non-medical use of prescription opioids. Um, so that's the what. What is the problem? Uh, and who? Um, are we talking about uh, young people that are, that are struggling with alcohol, you know, 12 to the 12 to 18 age group? Are we talking about the 18 to 25 age group that is struggling with opioids? Uh, are we talking about uh, elderly misuse, uh, misusing non-medical, uh, misusing prescription drugs? Uh, so, so who, 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 which population are we talking about? Which segment of the population are we talking about? And obviously, you know, I use examples that are related to age. It's not just age. Is it gender? Is it, uh, you know, uh, is it certain cultural groups that are struggling? Um, you know, so who are the the people, or, or is it people in certain situations? So, for example, uh, we're seeing that uh, individuals struggling with mental health are um, struggling with substance use. So, it's, it's people with mental health challenges. Those are the who that we want to address uh, in our efforts. Um, when? When is substance misuse, when, when is substance misuse ha happening? Uh, that can be thought about in terms of the age range. So when in terms of, you know, as a, at, at high school, in high school, is it uh, after high school, is it um, adult? Um, but also when could be, you know, there's certain times of the week or certain times of the month or, or certain times of the year. Uh, you know, as we're approaching the holidays, for example, the, the tend to see from previous year a spike in substance misuse because people are struggling with um, with the holidays, uh, which for some people can bring up a lot of anxiety and, and depression. Uh, so is it is it is it this time of year? Um, is it a particular time of the week? You know, weekends. You know, young people are uh, go out, binge drink, and um, and are expose themselves to negative consequences of underage drinking or drinking in general, drinking and driving, for example. So dealing with that weekend problem of alcohol use and 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 uh, problem behaviors around alcohol. Um, where? 
Um, so for example, if you're trying to address underage drinking, what is what exactly is the underage drinking problem in your community? Is it that young people are going to um, their, their homes? You know, be, uh, young people are hosting parties when their parents aren't there, so the drinking is happening in people's homes. Is it at school? Um, is it um, out? You know, football games. You know, Friday night football games. So where exactly is the drinking happening? If that's the issue, um, how? can be, you know, how are uh, young people are accessing alcohol? So part of the problem might be, um, again, using the example of parents being out of, uh, you know, parties at people's homes, how uh, are young people accessing alcohol through their parents' own liquor cabinet? Um, or is it that your liquor establishments are not uh, following policies to ID uh, young people? So and so young people are accessing it to directly through liquor establishments. So again, it's determining how um, are young people at, or people accessing um, substances um, and why. And again, those are the risk factors. Um, risk factors can include, you know, as I mentioned before, to mask mental health challenges uh, like anxiety or depression. Um, is that why people are using substances? Um, is it young people using substances because there's nothing better to do in the community and what they need is alternative alcohol-free activities? Um, so again, that's another, um, you know, the why, uh, trying to understand what are the risk factors. These are all the questions you want to be asking to better have a sense of not only what is the problem uh, that, or problems you want to address, but also why are they happening. Um, so let me pause here. And again, we're trying to make this very interactive and ask you, so we're going to be asking you questions throughout. Uh, so I want to ask you now, what are your challenges with um, collecting data to understand uh, these, uh, to, to answer these questions. Uh, so thinking about what I just said about the what, who, when, where, how, and why, which of these questions do you struggle to answer? Why, you, why uh, what, what kind of challenges do you have uh, related to these questions? And you can either unmute your line and actually talk, raise your hand and we'll, we'll make sure you can talk or you can write in the chat. And I see things coming in the chat now, like community participation, people do not wanna share data, finding local data, assuming your sample's representative, um, accessing current data, um, accessing the population, people who are skeptical, uh, people getting people to answer. Um, I'm in a rural community, so getting specific Current data is difficult. Um, uh, access to the community and funding to make the process more functional. Schools are scared to share data around student substances. Erin, uh, there are a couple of hands raised. If you oh, great. To Thank you. I was like so busy with the chat. Great. So Claire, do you want to unmute and ask your question or share your, your challenge? For me, my challenge is getting the data from my uh, my fellow colleagues in case they might not be able to collect the data in the timely manner or they have issues collecting it themselves and then it getting to me. So I'm kind of the end line of that. And so that could be kind of difficult. Actually getting it, actually yeah. Yeah. <laughs> having it in hand. Got yes. it, got it. Great. Um, Sean, did you want to share? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of the times, at least with when I, when, from the challenges that I've seen, was getting an accurate representation of the, the area we're at. So a lot of times it can be like one suited, like a lot of um, when we break it down, it just seems like, oh, one male answered and then like 30 female answered. And you're like, mm. OK, how is that a representation on who really is using what in this in that area? Mm. That's great. That's a great point. I'm sure, Shai, you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I appreciate uh, these challenges, and hopefully we're going to uh, uh, address some of them um, in the next few slides. But Sean, to your point, I believe actually the very next slide, um, it's like a great segue. Um, uh, well, actually, two more slides. We'll, we'll talk about the importance of um, cultural responsive ways of collecting data. So we'll definitely come back to your point. Um, but thank you for those challenges. Um, so I do see I, ha I have this other exercise I wanted to try out. Um, we're not going to actually talk about gathering data. And again, uh, hopefully um, by talking about the different ways in which you can gather data, address some of those challenges. Um, I first want to just check in with you all. How do you all feel about uh, how data savvy are you? Um, so how much of an expert are you with data? Um, the, there's, as you see, a continuum from novice. I can count to 10, and that's pretty much about it, um, to expert. I do calculus in my dreams. 
Here's how you're going to respond to this. Uh, we're going to use the annotate option um, in Zoom. If you look at the top of your screen, it should probably say something like, you're now seeing Shai Fuchsman's screen. You should see at the end, oh, Michelle, thank you. You're already uh, role modeling. Uh, you should see uh, view options. If you uh, click on view options, the fourth item on the menu should be annotate. If you click on annotate, you should see stamps. Click on stamps. You can pick any shape you want. I see uh, we have a couple of stars. You can keep doing stars. You can do a heart like Sean, thank you, and Cecilia. Uh, great. I see a lot of you in checks. I see a lot of you are finding the annotate and you're going right into the exercise. I, I love it. Um, so I see there's a, definitely a lot of people leaning towards the, you know, between the middle and the experts. So a lot of you are feeling comfortable with data uh, all the way to a couple of stars on the expert side. Um, and then there's some people who are leaning more in towards the novice. Um, so no one at the, uh, the novice extreme. So I'm glad that people can do more than count to 10. Um, but um, but yeah, but some of you are certainly um, in that um, leaning towards, you know, I could definitely um, use some help with data. Um, I love seeing this. It's like watching uh, popcorn pop, um, seeing all the results. Um, and I think this is about the moment in which the popping is stopping. So it looks like most people got a chance to respond. Um, so, you know, this is, this is also kind of interesting to see the range that you, you all have, um, in, in, that we all have in this virtual room, the virtual space that we're in. Um, so again, I'm going to try the next couple of slides, move you a little bit further to the right. Um, so let me just delete those. Um, how can I do this more? Let me find my annotate. Oh, mine is a little bit different. Um, annotate, there you go. Uh, and I'm going to clear, clear all drawings. Thank you all for, um, participating. Um, so. This is where we go back to Sean's point. Um, as I was mentioning, Alan, thank you for the heart. <laughs> um, let me just, well, I'll keep it there because why not have the heart on this on the slide? Um, but anyway, cultural competence uh, is a key uh, uh, element of um, uh, how we collect data and doing an assessment practices. And that goes back to uh, Sean's point about really making sure that you're not only when you're collecting data that you are, um, collecting data from the range of perspectives in your community, that you recognize that all voices have something important to say that you really want the whole range. You don't want to collect information from 50 people and realize you had one male and 49 females, as, as Sean said, or any other kind of not well-represented um, uh, range of, pers uh, of um, perspectives. And part of that includes to begin with that humility, that recognition those voices are important. Um, and then to the second point, you want to make sure that when you're recruiting participants, when you're thinking about how you can collect data, that you're thinking about how do you make sure you do uh, collect data from everyone? What are some of the barriers um, for collecting data for certain groups? And how do you address those barriers before you even begin the process? So for example, if you have a non-English speaking segment of your population, how do you make sure that the data collection tools are you using are available in other languages so that those who, who might not speak English well can participate as well? Um, or if you have, you know, to Sean's example, I'm just going to use Sean, if you, uh, if, if you don't mind, um, you know, if you've collected data, you know, you've done surveys and you realize, you know, for some reason we have way more girls than boys participating, how do we kind of push that data collection a little bit further and figure out, okay, how do we get uh, more boys to participate in in our um, in our processes. So really thinking about and troubleshooting uh, any barriers to really making sure that the entire community is represented. Um, and then not only that, but also that the tools themselves, the way you ask the questions, um, are reflective of all the the values, the beliefs of all members of your community. That you're not perpetrating inequity by asking questions that uh, might be offensive to people or might. Um, uh, not use, you know, affirmative um, language, as, as uh, Rebecca talked about earlier, to make people feel like, um, you know, you're not really uh, taking them seriously. Um, all just different ways that you want to really thinking about um, collecting data using tools that are really um, meant to be culturally responsive to everyone in your community. And then once you collect the data, um, it's important when we're doing prevention efforts, again, to be culturally competent, to be culturally aware, to look at um, the different, uh, use the data and disaggregate the data to really understand who are, how are different uh, segments of your, your community being impacted by substance misuse uh, consumption patterns, by risk factors, by consequences uh, in different ways. 
Uh, so, you know, our, our members of uh, uh, your community, people of color in your community, experiencing substance misuse differently than, than you know, say, white member, uh, the white segment of your population, uh, or risk factors. Um, you know, people, you know, LGBTQ um, students facing certain um, discrimination practices that are a risk factor for substance misuse. Uh, so kind of looking, using the data to, to help you see those uh, inequities in both uh, risk factors, consumption patterns, and, and consequences. Um, and then not only looking at what are the challenges by culture, but also looking at using data to identify protective factors. So what are the ways in which certain cultures, their beliefs, their practices actually serve as protective factors? What, what, is, what are the, the, the strengths, those, uh, the elements of resiliency that each community uh, or each segment of your population brings? Measuring that as well. Um, so, so that's, we, and we wanted to talk about cultural competence up front, just so that it's always kind of, you bring that lens uh, through, to the process. And now we're actually gonna go through the process again, keeping that cultural responsive um, lens as we think through uh, each one of these uh, steps. Uh, so what type of data do you need? How will you get the data? Who will you get the data from? And I think that was another challenge. Uh, sorry, I forget the, the person's name that talked about. We have the data, I'm just not getting it. You know, my staff isn't collecting uh, the data, isn't sharing the data with me. So it's not only is the data, does the data exist, but how will you get the data? Who will you get it from? Um, and then when and how often will you get data? So how often do you want to collect data as well? So these are all uh, questions as you're developing your data collection plan. And we're going to go through each one of these. So first, what type of data? Um, so data is really anything, any kind of information that is helpful to inform, to answer those questions that you might have to answer, to address, to develop your prevention efforts and to measure the effectiveness of your prevention efforts. Um, we can think about that whole range of different kinds of information as falling into one of two buckets. Quantitative data, that's always numbers, age, weight, number of uh, substance, uh, number of times people engage in substance uh, substances, number of times people uh, on average uh, spend having dinner as a family, all kinds of ways that we can measure things through numbers. Um, those are the, quant that's quantitative data. Qualitative data, oftentimes not always, you know, we tend to think about data as being quantitative. Qualitative data is equally as important. Uh, involves narrative or visual or output, uh, uh, visual output or audio output. Uh, so uh, in terms of data, collecting data, focus groups, interviews, observation. You know, if you want to find out how well is uh, a, a school-based program working, in working, um, having someone uh, from the outside uh, come and observe the implementation of the program, uh, not only using a rubric or checklist in that can be translated to numbers, but also just kind of um, uh, watching the how the implementer and the participants are engaging with each other. Uh, that's another way of uh, that qualitative data is important. Um, so um, think about you know what how can quantitative data be helpful to you? Think about how can how can qualitative data be helpful to you? Um, and there's benefits of each. Um, so the quantitative it's standardized. So if I collect number of um, times that um, student raised their hand in one classroom and then I do it in the other classroom, I have a standardized measure, you know, number of times students raise their hands. That's very standardized. It's exactly the same in each classroom. Whereas if I'm just running a narrative of what happened in the classroom, it's, you know, um, if I write it versus someone else writes it, the narrative, we might be looking at different things. Um, sorry, let me give that example, a better example of that. If I measure the number of times a student raised their hand in one classroom, someone else measures a number of times a, a student raised their hand in a different classroom, that's the same measure, two different people collecting exactly the same information. Whereas if the two of us are measuring, are uh, writing our impressions of what's happening in the classroom, that's not really standardized. That's, you know, we each kind of look at different perspectives. So that's why quantitative, think about things you can measure with numbers uh, is more standardized, more succinct. So if you can, much easier to present uh, data, uh, quantitative data. If you have a bar graph, you can represent, uh, you know, that represents uh, hundreds of responses, um, as opposed to if you want to represent hundreds of uh, responses by interviews, it's much harder to um, do it in a succinct way. Um, easily aggregated for analysis. So there's a lot of quantitative analyses that we can do from average, we can average numbers, we can do correlations, regressions, all kinds of uh, interesting analyses using uh, mathematical uh, analytical tools. Uh, systemic, 
Uh, so we are collecting the same data. Over, we can collect the same data over and over and over again. Uh, always asking the same questions, getting the same range of numbers. So if I ask a Likert scale from one to five, um, how helpful was information presented today? Um, we can keep doing that every single webinar and always measure, you know, that one to five scale across multiple webinars. Whereas if I just ask for an open-ended question, helpful, but not as systemic, we're going to get all kinds of different answers, um, as opposed to the range of just five answers um, in a Likert scale. Um, easily presented in, um, in in small space, so again, uh, it's succinct um, when I want to when I want uh, when we present it. Um, and it's generalizably is widely ac accepted. So we have all kinds of mathematical analytical tools we can use to um, use a sample sample data from a particular population um, and, ex um, and, 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 and determine um, how that, uh, sorry, we can use a sample of the population to extrapolate how, um, how people feel in the broader population. So for example, when we do opinion polls uh, in politics, we might um, only sample a thousand people um, of a population of three million uh, in a particular state, um, and we can then use that the responses from a thousand people and extrapolate it to how three million people will vote. Um, that you can't really do if you're collecting qualitative data. So those are the benefits of quantitative. Qualitative has its benefits. Uh, you can better explain the why if you really want to understand the reason behind numbers. So if people are saying, you know, we only, you know, on average we only spend uh, twice a week eating as a family. Well, why? What are the barriers to sitting for dinner as a family? Uh, you know, you can kind of dig deeper into the data. Um, it can reveal areas of refinement. Um, you know, if you are trying to better understand, um, you know, why a program isn't working, you know, with a quantitative survey, you can ask, you know, did you enjoy the program? Was this a good program? But if you want to know, well, why aren't people liking it? You know, for, or in this webinar, if I ask you, you know, from one to five, how helpful this was, but if I want to really understand why it wasn't helpful, um, that's when qualitative uh, open-ended questions might be more helpful. Um, can produce surprising information. Um, you know, I mentioned before that in Likert scale, we only have five options. So I can, you know, have, you know, I know exactly what kind of answers I'm going to get because it can only be somewhere between one to five. Whereas if it's an open-ended question or qualitative data, we can find surprising uh, answers that we might not even thought about. Um, can help to explain short-term outcomes. Um, so, for example, um, you know, I talked before about the example of uh, to reduce underage drinking. We want to reduce um, access to alcohol. Um, so, uh, and and let's let you know you want you know let's say the long-term outcome. You, you know, you're not achieving long-term outcomes. Students are still drinking. You want to better understand. Well, why why didn't we achieve the long-term outcome? What about the short-term outcome of reducing access to alcohol? Then we really get. Um, and, and therefore, and how did that impact the long-term outcome? Um, can help to drain new ideas or theories. So if you think about a focus group, you want to have better have better understanding of why do um, why are people why are young people in your community drinking? Uh, having a conversation about it can generate new ideas, new theories that you might not have even thought about. Um, and then also, it's perfect for pilot testing. So if you want to uh, pilot test a survey, for example, uh, you can have people fill out a survey. But then ask them questions like, "Well, was it was the survey easy to understand? Was it helpful, uh, or was it was it um, did it ask the right questions? Did you feel like there were questions that you that you wished you were asked?" So that's a great way to co collecting uh, qualitative data to uh, better understand the something you're piloting, whether it's a, it's a survey or a program, um, is just getting people's impression through qualitative data uh, is more helpful than to quantitative data. So those are the benefits between uh, between the two, um, and it's never really a one or the other. Uh, so I'm kind of comparing the two, but as you can see, because both have benefits, um, you want you might want to be thinking about a combination of quantitative and qualitative, uh, so you have the best of both worlds. Um, and that's what we call uh, mixed methods. Mixed methods refers to using both quantitative and qualitative uh, tools to collect data. Um, so the approach of using mixed methods also has pros and cons. Uh, so the pro, obviously, uh, one pro of using mixed methods is that you're using the strengths of both methods uh, to compensate for each other's uh, weaknesses. Uh, so sometimes it's good to be able to summarize data with a Likert scale, one to five, all those answers, and also to have the the um, the range, you know, additional answers that are not being offered um, in a closed-ended question. So having both uh, options might be helpful. Um, 
results may be useful for a variety of audiences. Um, so for some people or numbers people, you know, they're not going to listen to anything you have to say unless you can demonstrate with numbers that you've made a difference, that you've reached the right number of people. Um, but other people wanted stories, anecdotal stories, you know, so great. You uh, trained a hundred, um, you know, you offered a training for a hundred parents on how to um, talk to their children about substances. But how did that make a difference in people's homes? How did parents actually take this information? What did they do with it? Um, they might want those stories. Um, and again, in combination with the quantitative number, and you know, we train 100 parents, and this is how that made a difference. Uh, results may be more credible to a variety of audiences. So not only do people want more, um, uh, you know, different people can better process different kinds of information. Some people process numbers better. Other people process stories better. Uh, some people, but it's beyond just how they process it. It's also the credibility. Um, you know, some people feel like anything that is quantitative that can be generalizable is more credible. Other people need the anecdotal stories um, to really understand that you're how you're making a difference. Um, but there's also cons when thinking about mixed methods. Uh, so obviously, it requires multiple skills. The kinds of people who can collect and analyze quantitative data. You know, someone who who can is an expert in developing a survey might not necessarily know how to run a focus group or how to analyze, how to transcribe and then analyze focus groups. So you might want to have, you will need more people in your team, uh, not only more people, but also people with different skills. Um, it also can be more expensive because rather than using one method, one survey, now you're doing a survey and focus groups. So that's more time if you're hiring an evaluator or a researcher, um, obviously more methods, more time, more money, uh, higher cost. Um, and then also there's a risk of contradictory or inconsistent findings. What if what your quantitative data uh, says contradicts the qualitative data. Now you have to figure out how to um, uh, make sense of different kinds of results. So those are the cons with mixed methods. Um, so just so something to think about, you know, how do we collect, should we be collecting quantitative data, qualitative data, or maybe a combination of both? So that's the kind, that's the what kind of data. Now we're going to move to the next question, which is how will you get the data? Um, by the way, we are going to pause in a second uh, to answer any questions you have. So if you have any questions along the way, write them in the chat, um, and Aaron uh, and or Rebecca will help to um, raise those questions um, when we pause. Um, and I think we have just a few more slides until we get to that pausing moment. Um, so anyway, so how we get data? Um, so first of all, um, a local data. Um, Sometimes we immediately assume that if we need data, we need to collect the data ourselves. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, sometimes you can use existing data. So finding what data already exists. If you're working for a community-based organization, for example, you might wanna check with your local schools. Maybe they have data that you need um, that, or that would be helpful to you or local hospitals or the police department. Um, you know, There's all, a lot of data that already exists that's already being collected that can help you inform your uh, your needs assessment process. It might even help you inform your outcome data. Um, so for example, if there's a youth um, health survey being conducted every two years, like a YRBS in your community uh, or in your region, uh, you can use that for your outcome evaluation data um, to see if there's a changes in behaviors. Um, so thinking about the existing data is really important before you jump into um, uh, collecting your own. Uh, and we're going to talk more again about combinations. It's never one or the other. It can be um, using local data along with um, collecting your own. Um, so if you are going to collect your own data, um, now you have to think about, well, what are the kinds of measures I'm going to use to collect data? Um, <clears throat> and it's important that we use good, well-developed, uh, well-researched uh, measurement tools, You know, the right surveys, surveys that have been developed um, with a lot of thought and research into them to make sure they're good um, surveys. Uh, those are what we call standard um, or standard me measures. Uh, so if you want to collect data on, for example, perception of harm among young people, uh, there already might be measures that already exist that are exactly what you need. And so, you know, you're collecting your own data, but you're collecting your own data using a survey that was already developed. So you're using someone else's or pre-developed um, tools to collect your own data as opposed to creating your own surveys. Um, and when we talk about standard measures and, and effective, uh, you know, robust measures, there's two specific things that um, we oftentimes think about in terms of uh, measurement for knowing if the the tool itself is a good tool. Um, th those are the psychometric properties of a survey, <clears throat> and those are uh, reliability and validity. 
So you want to know how reliable is the survey and how valid is the survey. Um, and just to explain the difference between those two things, reliability um, has to do with um, whether the tool measures this will measure the same data. Uh, you know, it's reliable to measure the same kind of data time and time and time again. If you use the same data, um, let's say with the same group of people, will you get the same kind of information? Um, and what I mean by that is, for example, let's say you want to measure um, how well your students are sleeping, right? So you want to know, are students sleeping well enough? One way, <clears throat> one kind of question you can ask is, um, you know, how tired do you feel today or, or right now? How tired do you feel right now? That could be an, a way to answer the question, are they sleeping well enough? Uh, by simply asking, how tired are you right now? Well, the reality is, um, if you're trying to figure out in general as an overall habit, how well your students are sleeping, asking them how tired you are right now is not a very reliable uh, way of asking it. Because if you're asking that question early in the morning when they just woke up, they're going to be very tired. If you're asking that question right after recess when they've just been running around, they're going to be less tired. Um, and then maybe in the afternoon, they're going to have that, you know, get, get really tired. Um, and so the time of day that you're asking that question, the day of the week, Monday versus Friday, um, all those things might um, impact how tired they are in, a, in a, any given moment. That doesn't really mean that they're sleeping differently within the same day. It just means that you know it's not a very reliable way of measuring sleeping habits in general. Um, if you ask the question, how many hours did you sleep last night? Um, that's a little bit more reliable because now you're talking about number of hours. So that doesn't matter if you're asking the morning or the afternoon or the evening. The number of hours I slept last night is just, doesn't change based on when you're asking me the question um, during the day. Um, but maybe um, it's not very reliable because uh, that doesn't tell you in general how well, how well I'm sleeping over the next, you know, you know, this the next this time of year. Um, because maybe last night I didn't sleep well, but the last five nights I slept better. So maybe a more reliable question is to say, um, on average, how many hours have you been sleeping the last three weeks? Well, now you have a whole you have an average, you have a whole range. It's a much more reliable. Um, way of asking that same question. So that's what we mean by reliability. There's also the idea of inter, uh, uh, inter um, uh, collector reliability, which is uh, the reliability if, if, if you give the same tool to three different people, will they collect the same data? Um, so for example, I used the example before, if you have three different people going to three different classrooms um, and you ask each of them to, um, determine how engaged are students. If you simply say, from one to five, how engaged are they? The level of engagement from one to five, my understanding of what engagement, what a one is versus five might be different from a different person. So that's not a very reliable measure. But if you ask, if the if we ask all three of us, how many times are students raising their hand um, in, each, in each session and we collect the same data for let's say a month, you know, at once a week for a whole month, each of us goes to a different classroom and, and counts how many times someone's measuring their hand. That's a much more reliable measure because it doesn't matter who's measuring. It doesn't matter what the, our opinions or biases are about level of engagement. We're all measuring number of times hands are up. Um, and then there's, so that's reliability. Then there's validity, which is you can have a very reliable measure. Uh, it measures the same thing over and over again. However, it's not really um, measuring what you think it's measuring. So let me give you a silly example. So let's say you want to know if people who eat at McDonald's are smarter than people who eat at Burger King. And you're trying to figure out, well, how are we going to figure that out? And you decide that people who are smarter, uh, people who wear glasses are smarter. You know, if you wear glasses, you might be, you must be smarter. So you have uh, researchers for a whole month straight going every day to McDonald's and Burger King for a few hours and counting the number of people who are who uh, who are in there who wear glasses. Now that's a very reliable measure. Number of people wearing glasses is a very reliable measure because no, doesn't matter who counts them, uh, it's the same number. It's going to be the same measure. But wearing glasses is not a good measure of intelligence. So you're measuring how many people are. You know, you can compare the number of people wearing glasses who tend to be McDonald's versus Burger King, but that doesn't really tell you anything about intelligence because there's absolutely no research, no evidence to show that wearing glasses correlates well with intelligence. So that's not a valid measure because it's not really measuring what it's intended to measure. So both reliability and validity are very important when we're collecting data um, and are very difficult to determine. You have to really measure uh, you know, 
uh, run, use the same tool multiple times and, and do a bunch of analyses to do that, which is why that is all a long, very long way of saying why it's always better to use standard measures that have already been developed and already been checked for reliability, reliability and validity. Um, and if you do have to, to develop your own surveys, keep those things in mind. You know, is this reliable? Is this valid? You might not be able to measure it, to have the um, capacity to measure it in a scientific way, but you can certainly keep those two ideas in mind. All right. So that's how you collect data. Um, so just to um, go back to the idea of finding existing data. Um, so the kinds of data you might want to be thinking about, uh, I mentioned before, school records, you have health surveys if you, the schools might be collecting, uh, mental health screening tools, more and more schools are measuring those. That might be an important measure um, of its risk factor, you know, how many students are struggling with mental health. Uh, hospitalization data, if you're trying to find out numbers of uh, non-fatal or, or fatal overdoses, uh, hospitalization data, and same thing with police or EMS data. So these are all different um, sorts of data that already exist in your own community that you can, um, if you're able to access, you can use in your efforts. Um, or, you, or, and or, you might want to use original data sources. Uh, so surveys. Uh, so, you know, maybe there is an existing parent survey. You might want to do that on your own because the schools only collect youth surveys, uh, focus groups, key informant interviews, qual that qualitative data, that might be things that you might want to collect uh, to develop, collect on your own. So that's your own original data um, source. Um, so let's pause here. Uh, first, I, um, if there are any questions, Aaron, I don't know if there's any questions about um, anything yet. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of comments. Yeah, um, so the number one question that we did see um, was, or the conversation that you're seeing is about, is is it okay to incentivize, like providing gift cards? Um, and it looks like other people are saying that's fairly common. And I guess we're curious, Shia, your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. Incentives are really important, especially when you want to be thinking about collect, getting the right sample. Um, um, yeah. Uh, you know, you want to get as many people to participate in a focus group or um, give you data. You know, you're asking, you know, when you're collecting data, even though you're doing it for the well-being of the community, you are asking people to spend some time uh, to help you with the data. Uh, so, for example, participating in a focus group. So um, providing an incentive is both um, fair and as long as it's the same incentive to everyone. So you can't give $500 if you are male and only $20 if you're female because, you know, you're trying to balance, you know, you have that problem that Sean talked about of more girls than boys. You really want to make sure you're providing the same incentive to everyone. Um, and that you're incentivizing in a way that doesn't actually interfere with the data. So you can't incentivize people if they answer a certain way. <laughs> you have to um, uh, make sure you're disconnecting the incentive from the data collection itself. Mm -hmm. Does that make Great. Sense? That's that's really helpful, Shai. Um, we also had a question that someone asked about if you need a lot of data, is it better to do one long survey or to break that up into smaller surveys um, and have people ask, uh, to continue to take a different survey over and over. I know that's a challenge we've seen in a lot of different places. So I'm curious your take on that, Shai. Yeah, I mean, there's no magical formula for how long a survey should be, but that is definitely something you should be aware of. Um, that's why sometimes when you do a survey, you, you may want to pilot it. So ask three or four people first to try it out, see how long it takes them, um, and know your population. You know, if you only have 45 minutes to do a survey in a classroom because that's the period you're, you're given, and you've piloted your survey and it takes people an hour to fill it out, then your survey is too long. Um, and in general, you also want to make sure that it's the most efficient survey as possible, which means the least number of questions to answer all of your questions. You don't want to throw just random questions just could be fun to know. You really only want to ask the questions that, um, that are really important to you, which is why you want to start with what is my big research question or questions, um, and then keep the survey as short as possible in a manner that answers all your questions. In terms of doing it once versus multiple times, um, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, you know, ideally you would have just one survey with all your questions <clears throat> as short as possible uh, and, you know, and reduce um, the burden on participants. If you absolutely have to, I, again, that's something to pilot, to try out and see how it goes, you know, is doing it, doing it two different times in three weeks apart, for example, does that work better? It really depends on your population and, and trying things out first is always a good idea. Anything else, Aaron? 
I don't see any other ones at this time. That seems uh, to be the questions. Are there any other questions? Um, you can throw them in the chat now or uh, raise your hand is another option. Um, and just ask your question directly to Shai. Take out Next the middleman. Yeah, and as, as people do that, I meant to also answer, uh, to ask you all the all a question, which is what are some local data sources that you've used to inform your needs assessment? So what data have you current, have you already used? Mm -hmm. And before, and while people are answering that question, like um, we did have another question about how, um, for surveys, how do you know validity in a population with high rates of illiteracy? Validity for high rates of illiteracy. Yeah, illiterate population. Um, so I'm not sure that validity is really the, the issue. If it's in a highly illiterate population, the question is, are you getting the right sample? Because if only a certain percent of your population can read, um, then they won't be, they won't take the survey at all. The measure might still be valid, but people can't access it because it's, um, it's not because they're, they, they can't read. So then you have to just think about different data collection methods. Um, so is there a way to collect the same data by having uh through interviews uh structured interviews so uh, using quant you know, if you're using if it's a closed-ended survey you can have people ask uh closed-ended questions um of a population that is predominantly or that is has a higher rate of illiterate students uh, illiterate people i should say um just an example i know it's not it might not be the exact um situation but you know if you want to measure uh, something for preschool students they tend to be <laughs> illiterate or because they're young um, so having a teacher rating uh, where someone else is rating the students um, is, is a different strategy than having the students themselves answer. So that's just, and I'm just using that example. I know it's, we're talking about different, uh, something different when the, you're talking about adult population is illiterate, but I'm just using example, uh, just sharing different ideas of how you collect data to address those barriers. So I hope that was helpful. Um, SG can shut us above barrier. Um, Where I see measures of regulation, hospital data are not publicly available, a major barrier. Yeah, um, obviously, um, laws are governing the confidentiality of, uh, of data, whether it's HIPAA or FERPA, um, need to be respected. There's a reason for that. Um, sometimes you can work with a partner like a hospital to have them de-identify um, de the data. Um, if there's ways for people to remove all identifying data, they can share that with you. Um, or if you sign a contract um, or, you know, th this involves legal stuff and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not giving legal advice, but there are ways of the, um, signing contracts between a hospital and a group to kind of include them into the um, data privacy clause, uh, you know, to allow them to have data as long as they don't share it with others. Um, but certainly de-identifying data, it might be a way to address that barrier. Um, and just in terms of my question, I see that a lot of people are using, um, state use surveys, which are certainly a um, great source, uh, or pride survey. Uh, I see Karen used also focus groups, can form interviews in qualitative ways. Community coffee chats, that is data collection, absolutely. If you're you know, going around and, and having conversations with parents through coffee chats and you're hearing what their perspectives are, that's data, that's absolutely data. So um, I love that. Uh, parent surveys through Google surveys, uh, school sent out or put on their website. Um, Monitoring the Future Survey, that's uh, NIDA, that's a national data source that provides, um, I think, definitely state and uh, maybe even some cities um, data. Um, great. So let me move on. Um, so um, we talked about existing data versus original data. So I'm just going to quickly talk about pros and cons. Uh, some of these are obvious. Um, obviously, if you're using existing data, it saves a lot of time, a lot of resource, a lot of energy. Um, it doesn't add any burden on subjects. So if um, you know you're not you're not adding any additional burden on subjects because the data already exists. So you're not asking people to do more. Uh, provides foundational information. So for example, um, you know the, the youth survey, the state youth surveys, Indiana youth survey, Illinois youth survey, um, provides a, a great foundation information. So every two years, so you can use that as baseline, um, and uh, knowing that you have it already because it's there, um, as opposed to you have to go and collect it. Um, and is oftentimes based on robust instruments. Absolutely, certainly the surveys, um, the, these state surveys are, are monitoring the future, these federal the surveys from federal agencies, those you can uh, pretty much assume that they're um, reliable and valid. Um, you might wanna check, 
Um, but something, but I know for a fact, definitely the Indiana and Illinois surveys um, are reliable, uh, have been uh, checked for uh, reliability and validity. Um, original data sources don't answer your questions. Uh, so obviously you have much more control about what is actually being asked if you're the one asking the questions. Uh, once you have it, you have access to it. So the example, the barrier before of, you know, hospital data, that's great data, but you might not have access to it. If you collect it, obviously you have it. Um, and so you don't have that barrier. Uh, provides additional information. So for example, you might have the, you know, look at the Indiana Youth Survey or your state youth survey and you see certain patterns and you want to understand the reason behind those patterns, going back to students with a focus group, with your own focus group, can provide additional information to better explain the existing data. Um, and it's specific to your population. You get to decide which segment of the population you're asking the question of. So those are pros and cons. Again, it's and it's never about one or the other. It's just you can think about both, a combination of both, and, and um, maximize um, the kind of data that you need. Oh, there you go. It doesn't have to be one or the other. How smart of a comment. Um, we know we, we, today we're really focusing on local data, but I just want to make one general comment, and some of you have already kind of talked about it, uh, which is even when you're thinking about your own local community, you might want to be thinking about different sources of data. So there's national sources of data. So for example, U.S. Census Bureau, you can put in your zip code and you, from a federal data source, you can get information about your population in your specific community. Um, Monitoring the Future is another great example of that. It's a federal, um, you know, NIDA is a federal agency, federal, federal data, but it provides data, um, if not for your community, certainly for your state. Um, so survey specific websites, that's NIDA and YRBS and others. Um, also your state agencies um, or state warehouses, um, you know, Indiana you survey, Illinois you survey, I know there's others, but those are the ones that you all mentioned. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, those are all good source of data. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but the specific ones to, in terms of how local data you can get from that. Like, can you look at a specific um, zip code or specific town using state these state surveys? Uh, some of them do allow you to to drill down to your specific um, community or at least a region of your state. Um, and then obviously local data. Um, you know, local data sources we already talked about health departments, treatment providers, police departments, schools, colleges in your own community can obviously provide you with local data as well. So even though you're thinking about local data, you might wanna think about getting local data from not only local sources, but from uh, potentially from some national and state uh, sources as well. Okay, so we talked about what kind of data, we talked about how you collect the data. Now the next question is who can collect the data? So these are just quick examples of all the different ways in which you can collect data where the collector is different. Um, so for example, self-collected data. So let's say I'm a teacher, I'm implementing a program, I want to measure the um, uh, fidelity of the program. I wanna make sure that I'm implementing the data exactly as it's planned. So I might collect data about myself, not about myself necessarily, but about my, my teaching. I might in the, uh, um, every single day, uh, that I teach the particular program, I might write down, these are the number of lessons I did, this is the number of activities I did, and this is how I collect data about my implementation of the program. I'm, the, I'm collecting data for myself. Um, Self-reported, that's when I might be the staff uh, person administering a survey to students. So students are doing, they're filling out the survey, I'm administering it to them, but they're the ones who actually collect, writing, uh, uh, giving data by themselves. So they're indicating, the number of substances they might use in the past three, 30 uh, days, they might uh, include data about, you know, um, protective factors. Um, but so anyway, they're reporting their own data that is being administered by someone else. Um, in, in, independent observation. Um, so again, talking about um, monitoring implementation, instead of having me as a teacher collect data on how I'm teaching the program, I might, I might have someone outside a program coordinator come and observe how I'm implementing it and having them indicate maybe not only what am I teaching, but how am I teaching? Maybe there's a rubric uh, to indicate how well am I doing? And that might be better to have an outside person collect data about me. And in this case, I'm not doing anything as opposed to self-reported data where I need to fill out a survey if I'm a student. In this case, I literally don't do the, the person, the, um, the subject of the data isn't actually involved in any way. It's just someone else observing them. Obviously, they should know that they're you're being they're being observed. <laughs> um, use of existing data, so that's no one is collecting data. Or data was already collected, so no one new is collecting data. 
Um, so you might want to collect data from, you know, you're, you're the data person, you're doing the data analysis, you're not actually collecting data, you're just using uh, existing data like school records, um, absenteeism, suspensions, et cetera. Um, and then there's this other cool idea called participatory action research, which is the people who you're collecting data about are actually the ones who are collecting the data. So think about, for example, a program for young people uh, that is designed to empower um, young people and you want to know how well the program is working. And because it's a youth empowerment program, rather than you asking them, are you collecting data? You tell them, this is the question we want to answer. Want you go out and collect the data on how this program is, how, is, is impacting you. And let's say they do, you know, they can be creative and they collect quality of data by talking to their peers, by taking pictures, by taking videos of the program in action. So they're collecting their, their data. They're figuring out how to collect their own data about themselves. Uh, that's what's um, called participatory action research because it's the, the participants are actually picking the action of collecting the data. So those are just, again, different ways of thinking about who's collecting the data. Um, beyond just thinking about the role of the, of the uh, data collector as, re as it relates to the subject of the data, uh, you want to think about specific partners. So maybe your organization doesn't have the, um, the capacity to collect data. Um, so you might want to work with um, uh, partners or you want to use existing data. So schools, you serving agencies, local government officials, we've kind of gone through all of them. These are all people you want to be thinking about in terms of data collection. Um, when and how often to collect data? So these are things to think about, to consider. Um, so um, you want to consider reducing respond burden. So that's kind of going back to that same, to the question that someone asked about how long should the survey be or you know when is the survey too long? You don't want to be asking, again, you don't want a survey to be too long. You also don't want to be collecting data over and over again. You don't want to have young people fill surveys every week. That's just too much for them. You're they're spending more time giving you data than actually participating in the program. So the more you can reduce respondent burden, um, whether it's by having the data collector do observations so that the participants don't have to actually do anything or just keeping the survey short, those are all ways to reduce the burden on participants. Uh, think about time of year, time of week, time of day, all these things can impact us. We all know that, you know, the, you know, again, with the holidays, that might, you know, collecting data during the holidays might be different than collecting it in the spring. It doesn't mean you shouldn't, it just means you wanna be thinking about how the time of the year might be impacting people. Um, time of week, time of day, um, especially if you're collecting the same survey, like doing pre and post, you might want to be thinking about collecting the data same time of week uh, and same time of day. Um, so Wednesdays in the morning, um, three months apart. Uh, that doesn't address the time of year, but certainly addresses um, the time of week and time of day. Um, one single data point versus two versus many. Uh, again, that answers that question before. Um, what I should say about it, I didn't say it before, but um, Having a survey that's too long is a problem, but having too many data points might also be a problem. So think about what is the least amount of data you can collect, both in terms of a one-time sitting, but also in terms of uh, fewer data collection points, but to make sure it's robust enough. Um, so, you know, for example, if you're doing focus groups or parent surveys, do you want to do it one twice a year at the beginning of the school year and the end of the school year? Maybe just doing it once a uh, once a year, just every fall might be better because uh, it's just parents are not going to have that much time to constantly be filling out surveys uh, and consistency across sites. So if you're going to collect data from multiple sites, how do you make sure that um, you're doing it consistently? Same instruments, instruments are reliable, um, so that you're collecting it in a consistent way. Um, so. I know we're in a little bit of time, but I do want to make sure that um, if there are any other challenges that we haven't discussed yet, um, I know there were some at the, at the beginning. I hope I addressed some of them through different ideas of how to collect data, but are there any additional challenges or additional questions? So feel free to go ahead, excuse me, and um, go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you want to ask a question directly to Shai, that's fine or share, excuse me, <laughs> share with your peers some of the challenges you've faced, especially with the local data. Collecting follow-up data. Anna, can you talk a little bit more about, about that? About what the challenge has been around to do that? And you can either unmute your line and, and share with us or you can type in the chat either way. And other okay, people. Can you hear me? We can. Hello. 
Okay, hello. Um, so I remember uh, whenever I was working with my graduate advisor and um, we were working on a SAMHSA grant, we had a really hard time following up with clients. And um, it was just really hard to, uh, to get their phone numbers as their phones had quit working or they had gone out of the community, they just disappeared. Um, so trying to get follow-up data for their treatment was really difficult. And uh, we also were collecting data from like clinicians and other community members. And we used SurveyMonkey to try and email the, the post data. And we did not get very great re um, response rates either because the mail went to spam or they just didn't feel like filling it out. Um, yeah, that, that was really difficult. So um, that is a common challenge when you're collecting data from the same people multiple times, um, especially if it's not a, um, a captive audience. Like if it's a school, that's easy. If it's members of the community or doctors, that's much harder. Um, I actually did a similar, uh, I, I, um, we did an evaluation here at EDC that also required us to follow up with young people in the community every six months for, multiple, for several years. And we use some creative strategies and I'll just share a few of them. Um, so obviously, first of all, you want to try to get as much um, contact information from the participants at baseline. So their phone number, their email, their address. We also asked, you know, is there a relative who, um, you know, these are all optional. You can't make people give you data, but at least ask. And sometimes people will give you that data, uh, that contact information, including a relative, you know, someone else who might know where you are. Um, so that was, that, that was, that's one way to make sure you have as much data as possible. We also had people and we had funding, federal funding, so we were able to have a couple of um, uh, college students call people every couple of months just to make sure that we still have the right information for them and, you know, that they haven't moved or if they have moved, um, you know, both phone and email so that we can figure out where they are. Um, also incentives. Um, so the way we did, we had them collect every time they uh, fill out a survey for us, the incentive was larger. So you got like $20 in baseline, $25. 0.1, $30.2. So the more surveys you collect, the larger your incentive was. So that was another incentive. Um, and we also even got creative. Like we used to send them birthday cards when there was their birthday, because that was one of the questions we asked them for their birth date. Um, and it just just to create this kind of like we're connecting, you know, we want to keep connected with you. We want to make sure you don't we don't lose you. You know, uh, I think we also send them holiday cards. Um, again, we're trying really, really hard to keep this big population of people all over the country, young people. Um, filling out surveys over time so these kind of creative strategies um and, and you know and, and or others um, might be um helpful as well and one of the other things that we tried to keep doing is also figuring out where do they where are they like we in, within the community like people tend to go to the library or, or faith-based organizations you know how can we find them and make mm. connections with those places <clears throat> Great, Shai, that's really helpful. <clears throat> I want to get to a couple of these other questions because I think they're really, really valuable and important. So I want to skip to Lisa Coleman's asking um, or saying that one of the challenges that they have is collecting local data to identify um, health disparate populations. And I think that's something that's really challenging. Is there anything you can share with the group that might be helpful in understanding kind of that local component of collecting data to identify health disparities and what populations they're impacting in, in local areas? Yeah, um, so part of it is just knowing what, just um, looking into what are the barriers. Um, is it a language barrier? Is it um, too few people? Is it hard to get them to, to do surveys? Um, and being creative with the data collection tools that you use. So for example, we tried to um, work in a community, uh, uh, specifically with people recovering from um, opioid use disorders, and that was a different population to reach. So we did a couple of key informant interviews. We just, we try to find them. We say, hey, can I talk to you for half an hour? There's an incentive. And we, we interviewed them. We didn't do a survey. We didn't try to get 50 people. We just try to get, uh, you know, as many as we could. Um, and just do quick uh, interviews where they just need to pick up the phone and have a conversation. So think, think about what are the barriers? Is it confidentiality issues? Is it concern about, um, you know, also are there members of the community uh, that are kind of people who can be your champions? Um, so are people who are the same race or culture of the people you're trying to reach, um, they might be able to reach to them in a better way than, than someone who's an out, seen as an outsider. So these are all strategies to be thinking about what are the barriers and then how can we get out around those barriers. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing some other 
uh, questions around or some challenges that schools can be hesitant in administering their extra survey. Um, and that's definitely a common challenge that we hear about. We're actually gonna have another um, event in a couple weeks about working with schools and parents and their and hesitancy to do surveys, uh, to do data collection. So we're gonna talk about that. That's a, a great one I would encourage you to sign up for. Um, and then, you know, I kind of see that, that kind of as a theme. Um, so the other, so, and someone said, uh, you know, another piece of advice would be to employ people from the community and invest in the community. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, so someone asked about um, social media as a tool. Um, I'm going to tell you too, like, look, keep your eyes open. We're going to have some social media trainings down the line, hopefully uh, later this spring, um, that might help you think about that. Um, um, yeah, and, and schools are overwhelmed with um, parents and you know, the fallout of COVID and other crazy things that have happened. So we often see schools, school boards and the districts stretched very thin. So um, again, that's something I think if you could bring that challenge with you um, when we do our webinar event on uh, working with schools, um, and that's gonna be in two weeks. Uh, so look for that result and that look at that. <laughs> um, it's right there. And what we will do during those, just as a little quick plug, and then I'll get back to Shai, one of the things we're going to do is really say, we're going to have you guys engage with each other in a peer sharing environment where you're going to talk about your challenges and you're going to talk about uh, and ask your peers what they've done and how they've approached these topics. Shai and I will both be there to support you as well, but we really um, want you to be able to learn from each other. And so those two events um, are coming up. One is on rural challenges and the other is on challenges uh, with schools and parents. So thanks for putting that in there, Rebecca. That's my plug uh, <laughs> for that event. You'll, um, so get signed up and we'll, we'll get you there. So um, <clears throat> let's see if there's, I think we can move on. Um, there were some other challenges that I'm actually going to write down for our our upcoming webinars. Yeah, thanks, um, Aaron. So yeah, as Aaron said, if you have more challenges, we'll have more time in the next two sessions to really just have a discussion about these. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left, so I just want to talk a little bit now about what do you do once you have the data? So how do you actually uh, use it, understand and use it effectively? So just a couple more slides. Um, so once you have the data, the question is, what what next? What how do you actually make sense of it? Um, and there's this um, a process by a group called School Reform Initiative, and we can send it out as a um, resource that came up with a, this idea of data dialogue. The idea of a data dialogue is that you bring multiple members of your community, um, and ideally people who represent different perspectives, and you really literally have a conversation about the data. And so everyone has a chance to provide a perspective on how they are making sense of the data. And as part of this process, they have a very specific protocol that has these uh, five different steps. Um, and you can, you know, anyone should use them, you can use them on your own too. But this is uh, particularly helpful when you're having this idea of a data dialogue, multiple people looking at the data. Uh, first, before people even look at the data, what are the assumptions that we're bringing? Uh, you know, what are, you know, it's always good to name those assumptions before we even look at the data to try to eliminate or at least name the bias we might be um, bringing in. And so we might say, uh, you know, fill out STEM, sentence like, I believe that, you know, so I believe that young people, uh, that girls drink more than boys, or I believe that, you know, um, older kids are going to have struggling more with depression than younger kids. So what are the things that I think uh, that I know, or that I think I know, um, and put those aside, and then you actually get the data, and you specifically, the next step is looking at observations. I can see that, and you're focusing just on observations, just what are you seeing? What is the actual data telling you? The answer is always an actual piece of data. Like I see that um, young people are actually that uh, younger students are actually more like are reporting uh, depression at higher rates or depressive symptoms at higher rates than older students. That's an observation. I'm not explaining it. I'm not trying to explain it away. I'm just observing it. After you have all the observations, everyone makes observations. Then you go into the next step, which is now you have a conversation about the observations. What are some of the inferences you're making? Like, I wonder, you know, this difference in age uh, for depressive symptoms. I wonder if this means that, you know, younger kids are um, more lonely. And we have a, an issue in middle school versus high school around uh, relationships. Uh, that's an inference. That, and, that, and, you, and you're saying in, in, um, in terms of wondering or asking a question. You don't know that for a fact. Well, these are things that you're wondering based on the actual data, based on the observations. 
And then you say, well, how can we confirm these inferences? And that's when you go to validation. Can we use multiple data sources uh, to validate some of these assumptions? Uh, that's when you start thinking about, well, this is what the survey says. Maybe we should do a focus group and ask these questions directly to young people. So that's a way to validate, confirm, or, or unconfirm some of the um, inferences. And then the last, last implication. So what does this actually mean? So if, if, if this is the finding, this is what we are seeing in the data, and this we confirm the reason for this, that this is happening, what does this mean in terms of prevention? What does that mean in terms of informing our action plan? Um, you know, going back to all those reasons why you would collect data in the first place. So those are five very specific steps, and you do one step at a time uh, without skipping steps. Uh, this is one way in which you can um, uh, make sense of data. And if you can imagine multiple people, especially people from different perspectives, all having that conversation can be a very rich conversation that is very much data driven. Um, so that's how you discuss data. There's also different ways to communicate data. Um, tables, charts, graphs, discussion, storytelling, these are all ways in which you can uh, communicate data. And I just want to give a couple of examples. Um, so going back to the needs assessment, so if I want to know, well, what is the problem? So you can review consumption data um, by different, you know, use by different substances. That's that, fir that first table on the left. Um, is it looking at substances, um, substance misuse over time? So is the problem getting worse? Uh, if it's alcohol you're concerned about, is the underage drinking actually increasing over time? Um, and how does that compare to other, to other communities? So it's different ways in which you can uh, present data, kind of answer your questions uh, when specifically the consumption, when you talk about consumption data. Uh, we talked about consequences as well. You want to look, think about the consequences of, of um, uh, you know, presenting data around consequences. Here, you use a pie chart. What are the consequences, uh, or what is leading to the consequences of fatal crashes among drivers? To what extent it's only alcohol, only THC, um, other substances, or multiple substances? So that helps you kind of understand how substance misuse is impacting people in your community. Um, we also talked about risk factors. So why are things happening? So if underage drinking is the problem that you identified, um, where where are young people getting it? Uh, so in this case, mostly from home without permission uh, or friends at a party. So the, the, the home-based drinking in this case is, is the issue, less so from people buying it at, at a store. Um, we also talk about not only uh, risk factors, but protective factors. So thinking about how to, me how to measure present uh, protective factors. Um, so this is uh, a social emotional uh, learning assessment. Uh, or results from a social emotional learning assessment, looking at specific social emotional competencies um, or school environment, I should say. Uh, you know, do you get encouragement at school? Do you feel like you matter at school? Do you feel like there's an adult that you can discuss important issues with in your life? And this shows how your school, how a school is doing in terms of providing that supportive environment. So that's just different ways in which you can present data and use data presentation to answer those original questions of what, how, why, where. Etc., um, in a way that makes sense to people, in a way that is easy to visualize. Um, but also think about you don't have to do it all on your own. Um, so, in terms of analyzing data and presenting data, once you have it, if you haven't already worked with partners, this might be another point in which you might want to bring in partners. A professional evaluator, there's a lot of evaluation organizations. Uh, there's the American Evaluation Association. If you Google it, um, there's actually a way. Uh, in that website, the American Evaluation Association can help you identify local evaluators. I think you put your zip code and it can help you find an evaluator. Um, college professors or college students uh, who are learning or are teaching a data analysis might love to have a project of analyzing real data. And so that might be a great combination if you can find students who are willing, you know, college students and grad students who actually want to help you because that's a, a learning experience for them or college professors who want to um, use this opportunity to uh, mentor their, their students. So thinking about local colleges, uh, think about you know, what are the skills of your staff within your organization who has different kinds of staff uh, skills. As this, present, as this webinar kind of present um, indicated, there's all kinds of different steps and ways of collecting data. And so thinking about the different skills you need, you know, who's really good at focus groups, you know, who's really engaging and can really engage people in conversation versus who's really good with numbers or who's really good with Excel or other kinds of data analytical software. Um, so think about who in your staff has which skills. Um, and then use your, your own participants. Um, I talk a, a little bit about participatory action research. That's another great way 
to have people help you not only collect the data, but analyze the data. So in participatory action research, not only do young people, uh, do pe the participants, for example, young people collect their data, but they will also help to make sense of it too. So in terms of the now, so that these are all the different ways in which you can engage uh, partners to analyze and present data. So that's my presentation. Uh, that's the webinar. Um, as Aaron said, um, and as um, Alyssa put in the chat, we have um, a couple more sessions that will focus on actions. Uh, I'm sorry, on challenges. Um, and we'll walk, we'll talk through it, not only Aaron and I, but also all of you will help each other. Um, so having said that, um, what I'd love to ask you all to do the next last two minutes before I hand it over to our colleagues um, is to ask you these two questions. What is one thing you learned or relearned during today's training? Um, and or what is one action you can take as a result of today's training? So if you can add that, if you can answer that question, I hope you have some answers for those questions. Um, if you can add those to the um, to the chat, that will be very helpful. Take advantage of local data. Thank you, Cecilia. A uh, local database. Um, thank you, Cecilia. Yep. Um, others want to add, chime in. Um, and with that, I'll also, um, we can also open up the floor for a couple of questions before we turn things over. And I'm just watching these challenges and we're gonna take a look at this chat and help us think about what we need to do moving forward for our next two events on rural challenges and challenges with schools and parents. Um, but it's nice to see that people have learned and relearned things around um, around data. So it looks like, like Shay, we had some, um, some good learning that happened today um, and we have more to build on, so. Um, and I love seeing all the things people learned, um, oh, sorry, um, using local data, uh, cultural, the importance of data, cultural competent ways of collecting data, but the spare action research, Pamela, Pamela I'm glad that uh, that was something that um, you've learned today. Uh, reach out to for local data. So yeah, absolutely, local data is key. Um, existing data, if you have it, um, definitely use that um, as much as possible because it's already there. Great, and let's you guys can go ahead and keep writing that in while we turn it over to our colleague uh, Rebecca to wrap us up. Thank you so much. I just want to let people know that. We have some upcoming trainings, um, as we've mentioned a couple of times, two more sessions in this data collection series, one focusing on rural communities in December 6th, the week from today, and then also focusing on schools and parents two weeks from today. We've got something coming up in December, uh, mid-December on tips and tricks for creating compelling slides and handouts where you can actually depict and share some of that data possibly. And then also we have an ethics series starting in January that'll run once a month through June and that will be uh, available soon. And then at January 10th, nothing about us without us, best practices for community-led prevention. Um, you are invited to join us at any time. I will put this information in the follow-up email. <clears throat> we also invite you to stay in touch with us and know what's happening by liking and following us on Facebook. And uh, we also have a, a newer uh, opportunity to follow us on LinkedIn, and we invite you to do that. I want to remind everyone that after the training, you will be directed to this link for a uh, follow-up survey, and this is, again, what helps us report to SAMHSA and continue to share this kind of information, and we want to thank you so much for being here. One last reminder, um, <clears throat> we have a, a telehealth survey that's being conducted through the University of Wisconsin, and um, we invite you to also participate in that. I will send the link um, it's looking at the changes, benefits, challenges, adaptations, and projections on how telehealth since COVID has changed what we do. Um, so uh, please know that we, your input will help us um, provide more information to SAMHSA and uh, other important folks. And uh, we'd love to have you participate and share in that, 
that uh, survey as well. So thank you so much for being here. And any last comments from Shai or Aaron? No, just thank you all for um, participating today. And I hope to uh, hear from you all next time. Yeah, thank you. We hope you can join us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Your participation made this great. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.